Good afternoon. I'm uh, Daryl West, Vice President of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, and I'd like to welcome you to our event on disinformation and Black voters. As we head into the last week of the campaign, there is considerable concern about disinformation in the 2020 election. Uh, we all remember how this affected the 2016 campaign and uh, how various uh, foreign actors sought to suppress a voter turnout. Last year, the Senate Intelligence Committee put out a report documenting foreign disinformation activities and how a number of those efforts specifically targeted African-American voters. Uh, they used uh, such uh, activities to keep turnout down and to try and inflame racial tensions. This year, we're already seeing misinformation targeted on black voters here in DC as well as elsewhere. And so uh, some of the unanswered questions is how will these activities affect the 2020 election and what can people do to protect themselves and the integrity of the overall election? In order to examine these issues, uh, professors at Howard University have launched a new project funded by the Knight Foundation on digital democracy, disinformation, and Black voters. Uh, that project is examining how disinformation is being used in uh, DC and what can be done to combat it. And if you'd like to see additional material on that project, you can check out their website at digitaldemocracy.howard.edu. That's digitaldemocracy.howard.edu. And they also have a Twitter account set up at hashtag HUDigitalDem. Uh, that's HUDigitalDem. Uh, to help us understand these issues, uh, we're delighted to have uh, four distinguished experts uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Ravi Perry is the chairperson of the political science department at uh, Howard uh, University. And I should note he is a, uh, also a former PhD student of mine from Brown University. So it's great to renew our acquaintance and congratulations, Ravi, on all the terrific uh, work that you are doing. Dr. Keisha Middlemoss is an associate professor of political science at Howard. Uh, Dr. Roger Carruth is an assistant professor of strategic legal and management communications at the university. And Dr. Bahia Muhammad is assistant professor of sociology and criminology at Howard. So, and if you have questions, uh, you can email them to us at events at brookings.edu uh, or post them on Twitter at hashtag digital democracy. So we'll start with a few questions uh, for our panel and then uh, we will uh, add some uh, questions from the audience. So uh, please uh, send in any uh, questions uh, that you have. So I wanna start uh, with uh, Keisha. Uh, maybe you could provide an overview on this uh, project, uh, what it is that you're attempting uh, to accomplish. Excellent. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's great to be here. So as the audience could tell, we are an interdisciplinary research team, and that required the agreement of two deans in two different colleges, four different departments, and the administrative role is actually really important to bring this research to fruition. Our whole goal really is to be able to collect data in DC from primarily black voters to find out about their use of social media and get the layout of the digital environment, but also then to use this data to answer questions about elections, disinformation, and then political activities that may either trigger or triggered by the information they receive on social media or if they're dissuaded from doing things based on what they learn. Okay, uh, thank you. That's very helpful to have that background. So Ravi, I wanna bring you into the conversation. I know uh, you have done a lot of work on urban uh, politics and uh, you're particularly interested in the uh, black vote in uh, DC. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, disinformation and particularly the targeting of black voters? Yes, I'm really grateful uh, to be uh, with everyone today. Uh, as Dr. Middlemass mentioned, this is such a, a team effort uh, uh, here at Howard University. And uh, this is driven by uh, so much, as you mentioned at the outset, uh, Daryl, about the Senate Intelligence Driven uh, uh, Intelligence Report from just uh, a little over a year ago that was bipartisan that indicated that there was significant targeting 
toward African Americans. In fact, no group uh, that was targeted by, by Russia in the last uh, presidential election was targeted more than African Americans uh, via uh, the, the, the group known as the IRA. Uh, and so this really precipitated, I think, a, a lot of uh, foundations like the Knight Foundation uh, to uh, kind of investigate how uh, we might be able to uh, develop the research to kind of better address this question. And uh, we are fortunate to be funded in our effort uh, uh, to uh, do so. And here in Washington, D.C., this is so significant because what we've seen over the years has been uh, somewhat uh, bimodal in that uh, in the Marion Berry years here, you saw high turnout, particularly uh, east of the river where uh, predominantly uh, much of the native Washingtonian African-American population yet resides in Ward 7 and in 8, and where they had high turnout uh, in mayoral elections and in Democratic primaries uh, during uh, other election cycles, uh, really uh, throughout much of the latter part of the 20th century. And, and some of that continued to uh, the earlier parts of this new millennium. But in the last 15 years or so, we've seen significant drop off uh, among African Americans at the, uh, in participating in um, the elections here in DC uh, at the local level. Whereas you might have 300 to 400,000 folks who turn out, for example, in a general election, uh, but only a few tens of thousands of them may vote down ballot in DC certain races. Uh, and, and of that drop off, a significant drop off is among African Americans uh, historically in the last five or 10 years in wards uh, seven and eight. The shift, however, that we have seen, perhaps because of the new uh, attention that misinformation has uh, gotten as a result of the media and, of course, uh, 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 wonderful organizations uh, that feature this topic uh, from their nonprofit points of view, and, of course, those of us who uh, research uh, this topic and try to expose uh, for the public uh, what in fact is going on. All of that I think has resulted in many DC voters east of the river, particularly those that are African-American, becoming that much more engaged this time around than they were four years ago. So for example, at this rate, uh, uh, just four years ago, not only nationwide did you have only early vote uh, returns in, in the a single tens of thousands of digits. Right now you have them in the tens of millions already. Uh, and, and that high uh, proportion of significant uh, uh, increased turnout to date uh, has also been the case locally here in DC elections as data recorded just today and last week as well uh, in the lead up to early vote uh, by the DC Board of Elections where we see a higher turnout now of African-Americans, uh, particularly in Ward 7 and 8 as well, than we did four years ago or even two years ago in, in the most recent primary. And I, and I do suggest that perhaps some of that is due to the fact that many folks are motivated by uh, the concern that they see perhaps associated with this current administration and the level of misinformation that they may have experienced. Yeah, those are all uh, terrific uh, points. So uh, Bahia, uh, I know you focus in particular on uh, young voters and uh, you're uh, concerned about how disinformation trickles down uh, to them. So uh, what have you seen uh, both in the past as well as uh, in this current election? Thank you so much for that question, Daryl. We uh, definitely thank you for this opportunity to engage in this conversation. Absolutely, uh, what we're looking for as the Howard University Digital Informers is to really utilize uh, this platform and this evidence-based practice um, underneath this study to be able to identify uh, the ways in which uh, Gen Z all the way down to Gen X are engaging in the American democracy. And so specifically uh, for our pre-survey interviews, we are asking individuals from 18 years and older on their different practices, really trying to understand what it means as it relates to misinformation as well as disinformation on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and even on TikTok. Oftentimes individuals utilize certain platforms where adult individuals are engaging with specifically among the black community um, as a means of understanding how information is digested. And what we're seeing now, um, very different than we've seen in the last four to five years is that the uh, voters are becoming younger. They're also becoming more critically conscious 
about those individuals who are on the platform and on the ticket. And so we're finding that individuals, specifically Black youth, are more educated, uh, more critically conscious as it relates to what really goes into the political endeavors. Uh, their civic engagements also are directly determined by their engagements with the criminal and justice system. And so we're finding that they're thinking a lot about um, how to make their communities and societies a better place. And they find this as an opportunity to do just that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So Roger, I wanna bring you into the uh, conversation. I know you're uh, interested in uh, disinformation in the marketplace, uh, the role of social media, uh, uh, black uh, uh, voters as consumers of information. So uh, what are you worried about? Uh, what are you seeing? Uh, there's a variety of topics being discussed. And first of all, I want to thank Brookings and uh, you, West, for hosting us today, uh, Mr. West, for hosting us today, and my colleagues uh, for being a, a part of this panel discussion and, and audience members. But what we're seeing, and given the digital nature that we're in and the 24 hour news cycle, content is always in the marketplace, it's always being produced and consumed. Uh, the benefits that we're seeing now, based on these digital platforms and the devices that we use, communications is now being handled in a two-way format. So now from this research, what we're seeing is that uh, consumers are choosing which way they want their, their, their content to be uh, viewed and heard. And so what we're trying to do with this, uh, with this study through both qualitative and quantitative methods is we'll find out the what uh, and then the, quali the qualitative aspects of the study would tell us the why. And ultimately what we wanna do from a, a media communication standpoint is figure out the best mechanisms in which to reach these audiences. Primarily in the past, uh, you had opinion leaders in certain communities that would be the, the bearers of information that elderly populations would refer to, uh, such as pastors, religious leaders, uh, coaches, mentors, and civic community organizations that community members would gravitate towards. But now, from a younger generation, as Dr. Muhammad talks about, uh, we're talking about influences, right? And these influences are in spaces where Gen Z and Gen X uh, lie. So when you're looking at mediums such as Instagram, such as Facebook, Twitter, and now TikTok, these are various platforms that engage consumers in a uh, voters in a, in, in a very unique way. And hopefully through this study, we can look at the various sections of the, the DC population and see which aspects of these various communication mediums would be the best way to touch base with these consumers and see how they not how are they not only consuming the content and information, but how they engage and react to it. And hopefully how that persuades or uh, empowers them to act or not to act based on the accuracy a thought of accuracy of that information. So hopefully through this process, we can answer some of those questions and then put some type of end product in place that can allow us to monitor and engage with these various um, voters in, in a variety of different ways. Now, it sounds like a fascinating uh, research uh, endeavor and you're gonna have very uh, rich uh, data uh, based on all these activities. So I have a question for uh, each of you and I'll start with uh, Keisha. What can we do to combat disinformation targeted against uh, Black voters? Are there particular strategies uh, that would be helpful here? I mean, what uh, can voters do to protect themselves and to safeguard their uh, vote? Keisha, we'll start with you. Thank you. So I think the best uh, strategy is to figure out the difference between disinformation, the information used to manipulate people or to um, purposely dissuade them from acting either in electoral or civic engagement and, and related activities. And then misinformation, misinformation being shared that is obviously false um, and it is wrong. And being able to determine is this false information is just a lie or is this misleading information that is going to then dissuade me to do something. So a strategy is literally stopping before we tweet or share something on Facebook and reading it. We've often got uh, the ability to fact check ourselves before we share information. And I think that's the first step in learning how to combat disinformation is not sharing it. Because we know once that false narrative is out there and then it might be picked up by a mainstream media source or echoed by an elected official, it becomes fact. 
because we've heard it so many times. We believe, oh, I've heard this before. It must be, it must be true. Um, and also I think the second strategy is to talk to people. So what we're doing today is we're talking to people is about disinformation, to be aware of it, to know that it exists. And in particular for black voters, because they were targeted in 2016, in 2020, it has absolutely exploded. And now there's robocalls and social media. And so the other third strategy is literally awareness and educating people about what is going on and why it is happening. Ravi, uh, your thoughts on how we can uh, combat disinformation targeted against Black voters? Well, I really appreciate Brookings hosting this discussion uh, because this is an issue that has been brought to light really in recent uh, years. And uh, it's so it's very contemporary. And so the data that we're going to be producing based on the feedback we get here in D.C. Uh, is really cutting edge in that we're trying to assess how Black uh, voters have in fact been perhaps uh, targeted and misinformed. Uh, is the first step. And then the second step, of course, is, is saying that, well, if we do prevent that, uh, uh, can we prevent them from, of course, being persuaded by what they may have, in fact, uh, uh, been targeted by? Um, and, and those are two separate questions. And so I think this, uh, what the possible solutions may uh, look like uh, as the research is uh, concluded uh, next year, um, might suggest that people find just the uh, preponderance of new kind of uh, social media disclaimers that in fact bring their attention to the fact that there is misinformation online, that that awareness in and of itself may in fact uh, encourage or discourage black voters from believing information that they see online in general, let alone information that maybe just be targeted to them for, let's say, an election-based purpose. This, in some cases, may uh, have uh, the, the kind of snowball effect of having uh, the implication that folks don't believe news and media in general, let alone news and media associated with politics. Uh, and so we don't know, of course, what the results will yield until uh, 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 the data is collected in, uh, here in DC. And so we hopefully, of course, uh, are looking forward to working with a bunch of local community organizations uh, and some of our partner centers at Howard University to gather that data. One other uh, hypothesis I would throw out there that you might, uh, be helpful in, in encouraging people to identify this information and then uh, make sure that they aren't in fact uh, impacted by it, um, would be uh, to consider how it is that they access information to begin with. Uh, and I think that question, it, particularly here east of the river in Washington, DC, is a unique question when we have challenges as relates to uh, uh, digital uh, infrastructure and the ability for some people to even access social media, let alone be targeted uh, via social media as a result. And, and yet that population could still be influenced by those that are targeted by social media. And so uh, we're excited to figure out what the results may in fact be next spring. Bahia, uh, any advice you have on how people can safeguard their vote? Absolutely. I think when we think about um, educating the next generation, we have to begin to be innovative and creative. Um, as a, a interdisciplinary team, there are members of this particular group, uh, specifically uh, Dr. Perry, as well as Dr. Hogan, who are incorporating these sort of uh, nuances into their college curriculums. And so really trying to get not only political science students, but also philosophy students to begin to think very deeply and critically about these issues and uh, these concerns for this particular study. In fact, we are incorporating undergraduate uh, individuals into the research process, as well as graduate students um, as a part of the process so that we are thinking about educating the pipeline. And again, this uh, intergenerational cycle of eradicating uh, misinformation and disinformation, I think, some of the things that we can begin to do is to engage in conversations with uh, the youngest among us, the children in our communities and in our homes. Um, oftentimes we are through COVID-19 trapped inside of our homes. And so children are watching uh, the debates. Uh, children are on the sidelines when the adults in the homes are engaging in these conversations, which is very unique, um, specifically as we know about the black family 
specifically in the DC area, oftentimes misinformation has been targeted towards the adult. And now what we're finding is it's trickling down into the younger uh, generation, specifically their uh, forms of social media. Therefore, it means that the adults must begin to also engage in the same way. So if they are only using Twitter or only on Facebook, they may um, consider uh, going on to TikTok and Snapchat and being able to see the information that's circulating so that they can engage in a critical conversation with young individuals whose eyes and ears remain open. At Howard University, we have a program um, on the campus called Freedom Schools. And oftentimes these are elementary uh, age children from the DC public school area who have an opportunity to be educated over the summer on the campus. And what they talk about are voting practices, what it means, what, uh, what is your right to vote? And also really trying to work to eradicate this draconian concept that your vote doesn't matter as a black individual. And so we really wanna begin to educate intergenerationally individuals to understand that that is one of the myths that we must begin to get rid of and also um, continue to address it as it pops its head up in different ways. So through this study, we are very interested in gaining that understanding from the young individuals that um, fill out the survey for the pre-survey assessment um, to let us know where they're actually getting this information from and how do they make sense of it. And, and from that, we plan to use that information to construct an evidence-based practice that we then can release to the nation on how Black individuals are gauging this information because it is very important. I think it's great that you're involving students, both undergrad and graduate students uh, in this, because uh, these problems are not going to be uh, unique to 2020. We're probably uh, going to see them continue in future uh, years, and we need the next generation to be equipped to uh, deal with these things as well. Uh, Roger, uh, your uh, thoughts on how to combat uh, disinformation targeted against Black voters? Well, um, I come from a communication, the School of Communication specifically, advertising and marketing and media relations. So with any product, with any service, the main thing that you try to do is make an emotional connection with your consumer base, with your voter base, so you can then persuade and change behavior, right? So what I'm seeing is that if you look back at the 2016 Senate report, uh, one of the things that came up, as, as, uh, as Ravi mentioned, was the direct targeting by the specific group. And what they did, uh, uh, they actually looked at issues that were hot button topic issues, whether it was around a very uh, violent killing of an African-American male in a particular communities. And they pounced on those activities, created forums and various platforms in which to get to provide venues to then start spreading information. And if I remember correctly, one page in the article suggested uh, through one of the, the informants that gave a, 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 store, a report to The Guardian, uh, when, uh, when, when something happened in the United States, they would blame the Obama policy, Obama policies failed. And uh, if I remember correctly, the Negroes are riding in the street and something needs to be done, right? So you hear that, that talking point, it gets picked up from a false narrative, from a false source, and then it spreads. And then if it comes from someone who inten it unintentionally picks it up, and passes on, passes it on to somebody who seems to be credible, as I mentioned earlier, an opinion leader, an influencer, then that whole narrative starts to spread. And if you look at what happened with that election with, with some people that may have supported some of the other Democratic candidates, if the outcome wasn't as they desired and this few added to that, they, 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 they sat on the sideline and they decided not to participate. And therefore the end result of what that disinformation campaign was designed to do was actually realized. So what I think uh, we need to do is, as voters, as well as uh, local community members is really, first of all, ask yourself uh, several things. Um, when was this information put into the, into the public space? Who sent it to you? Why, matter of fact, why is it coming to me? Am I affiliated with you? Am I connected to you through uh, another person, through a civic organization? How did you actually determine that this information would be something uh, useful or beneficial to me. So we have to actually take ownership to a certain degree of the information we consume and then how we behave and then pass that information on. So as you are, as uh, you know, my colleagues mentioned, getting students involved that are at Howard University, we're all at a central place now, although we're dispersed, 
But what these students do, they become change agents from our university that go back into their community and say, hey, guess what I'm learning at my university? Check this out, check that out. So that process, I think we could incrementally start to see change and also with that process and through that process by having the students involved, they get to understand the process of civil, civil engagement, civic engagement, I'm sorry. So from not only from a national level, but from a very local level, here in DC, we have school board offices that are being, uh, being um, challenged right now. We have ANC seats, we have city council seats and, and a variety of other uh, community-based um, organizations or offices that are available for participation. So if they can see that and learn those processes from a very, very basic level, then they can actually spread that, that concept to how do I participate in my state, maybe in, in a gubernatorial, gubernatorial race, in a, a Senate race, in a House of Representatives race. So I think the idea of, well, first of all, self-ownership in terms of the information I consume and how that I pass that on and how I choose to engage in it with the people that are in my circle as, as Dr. Muhammad mentioned, because it really starts by that incremental step-by-step -step process. So Keisha, uh, we may not have a result on election night. I mean, several people have warned us it may take a while to count all those mail ballots. I mean, we know half of people already have uh, voted up to this point through absentee ballots or taking advantage of early voting. So we've talked uh, kind of mostly about disinformation in the context of the campaign part. What about kind of election night and thereafter? And let's just say it may take a few days for a Pennsylvania or other states to count the ballots. What are the responsibilities of the news media in reporting on the election, particularly in terms of the disinformation angle? Like, will there be new opportunities for manipulation if it takes a while to actually get the final results? Yes, and that's a really important question because this disinformation campaign will continue through until a candidate is actually chosen. And unfortunately, because of the partisan nature of U.S. elections, because of the uh, types of policies that have been debated over the last couple of months, this election matters for a lot of people, particularly in the Black community as it relates to COVID-19 and being able to actually address its its Spread. Um, but for disinformation, it will continue because there may be one particular candidate that challenges the actual outcome. And I believe that the media needs to take a conservative approach to election night on, the, on November 3rd. And that means not taking a conservative approach and, and calling a, a winner, but also educating voters about the process. There are millions of mail-in ballots, but there are 50 different state rules about when those mail-in ballots will vote or will be counted, excuse me. Is it that night that they have to arrive? Or in Pennsylvania, for instance, they can arrive all the way until November 6th, 5 p.m. So we are going to really have to be educating individuals, I hope the media does this, but also on our own Twitter accounts and, and Facebook, is educating people that it is okay to take a few days to count ballots. This is democracy in action. And that we should be able to focus in on those five or six battleground states and tell people about the rules, what is acceptable, and that we should not rush to a conclusion just because we're on a media timeline or that someone else wants a response. Um, it, it might, it, I, I expect it might take up to a week before we actually know and have a clear idea of who gets to 270 electoral college votes and that should be okay. I hope you're wrong on that prediction, but you may be right. Uh, and certainly if it does take several days, the opportunities for mischief uh, rise pretty substantially. So Ravi, uh, your thoughts on election night, and let's say it does take a few days to uh, finalize uh, the ballots. What what should we be worried about there? Yeah, yeah, unmute. Yeah, Ravi, you need to unmute, please. Oh, my, my I think I think it uh, depends on who it will, uh, will honestly perhaps be leading at the top of the ticket. Uh, in terms of how it will be interpreted live 
on uh, Tuesday night. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because people remember that this current administration uh, did put, you know, red lock boxes on post office uh, um, on boxes in their neighborhoods um, that they re they have seen images on video on uh, social media of boxes uh, put up by various state boards of elections, et cetera, uh, that have been set on fire. Um, and so I think folks are very concerned about the pace of information they receive on election night because they are also concerned that perhaps a delay is funneling a narrative that certain groups uh, of people uh, were targeted uh, to ensure that their ballots were not effectively received or counted. And so, in other words, if I think uh, the hunch uh, of the media, because of course they're not going to uh, end the night without uh, providing some presumptions and assumptions and, and uh, arguments about where they think the race is headed, if it, we don't have a conclusion on Tuesday, uh, I think the tone of that is going to really matter. If Trump is kind of viewed as the likely victor, then I think people are going to be very concerned about, well, what happened to my ballot? Was it even counted? If I put it in the United States Postal Service, was it even received? Uh, and um, if, if the, the result is different, I think people um, um, may still be curious about the pace of the counting in terms of their patients, but less concerned about uh, whether or not uh, the delay is related to some kind of uh, misinformation effort. And this is serious because, you know, we just saw this week that uh, according to uh, government reports that this election is being interfered with at the moment. And, you know, Black folks are used to being uh, targeted by uh, and through and the use of government resources and support over centuries. And so uh, for that to feeling to be kind of the undercurrent for many in this election where uh, the, the options are uh, on the one hand, a, a president running for reelection who was in fact endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan, uh, which of course has a particular uh, insensitive uh, horror relationship of horror with African-Americans uh, over centuries. And then you have another on the other side, uh, you know, a candidacy that includes uh, a historic uh, vice presidential nominee of course, in that uh, uh, the background that she represents um, um, as part of the ticket. And so I think that that's gonna be what's on people's minds on Tuesday. And uh, the question will be whether or not um, the uh, narrative is driven by the media uh, um, that's going to influence how people react to the delay in ballots being counted. But nonetheless, uh, I agree with Dr. Middlemass that we won't likely have a result on Tuesday. Bahia, uh, your thoughts about next week and what we should be thinking about? Absolutely. Um, I would say that, you know, in the midst of waiting for results, it creates uh, an incubator for misinformation. Um, and I just want all of our viewers and individuals to know specifically in DC that this team of uh, digital informers are here. You know, we have a website. Please make sure that you all you know, have an opportunity to go there, talk about your concerns, talk about, you know, your issues, share with us the things that you are reading. Um, the team, as you heard uh, from Dr. Middlemass and Dr. Perry uh, down to Dr. Karuth, that these are experts. Uh, and so we're in a different space than uh, we may have been found before. I would say, uh, you know, individuals must be patient, must be patient. And I think at this point, focusing more so on the vote, getting out, doing what you need to do. If you didn't send the ballot in, send it in now. And if you didn't, you know, get out there and rock the vote and um, take care of yourself, you know, put on a mask, social distance. Uh, don't forget about the realities of what we're being faced with right now um, in the midst of different misinformation and disinformation that will, of course, come out um, during that time. I think once you do your part, um, then it is to kind of sit back and really read and reflect and talk to individuals about it. Um, I don't think that uh, this should be something that's done in a bubble, that individuals should be isolated and kind of feeling that they are alone. Um, this is a community endeavor. Um, and I think as long as we lean into one another, it gives us an opportunity to troubleshoot our ideas and our fears 
um, off of one another so that we uh, act accordingly. I think specifically uh, because my work uh, rests itself in uh, the criminal justice system that, you know, incarcerated individuals that are located in DC that will be voting um, oftentimes are erased through COVID-19 of communicating with their families. And so some of these conversations need to happen early on. Um, as well as through correspondence, being able to send in, not misinformation, but sending in viable sources for those individuals that are incarcerated and are voting and also will be waiting much longer for those decisions to also be a part of uh, this democratic process. And so there are just so many prongs uh, that are connected to it. I think right now we should definitely be focused on rocking the vote um, and making sure that we do our part on this end um, and really leaning into our patients and our experts in our communities, specifically those among the Howard University community to be able to help individuals specifically in DC walk through this process. So Roger, I want to get uh, your thoughts on uh, things we should watch uh, next week, and then we're going to turn to some questions from the audience. We're actually getting lots of uh, really good questions. Sure. Um, I would say, first of all, from a, a perspective of communications media and being an, a, a, a communication scholar, we, we tend to rely on the media. We call it the fourth estate, the unofficial fourth arm of the government, to kind of be that barrier of truth, hold both parties accountable, and really be a resource to the people, the viewers that are watching and relying on them for, for credible for information. So I think at the point of the, the election and out of the election, uh, it, it kind of gives me an airy feeling maybe about, about 2000 with uh, Al Gore and, and George Bush and maybe a little bit higher form of, of steroid, if you will, in terms of the anxiety and anticipation. So we, we're all gonna be watching some form of preferred media, some form of content consumption at, on that night you know, and even leading up to it. So not only should we rely on the media being fact checkers and giving us uh, information, even if it's unverified information or they can't confirm, you know, make those references and make those, mo those notifications known. So at least we have a sense that something is going on and then we could choose to engage how we want to. In addition to that, I, you know, some, day, some days you have social media feed in the press and vice versa. So you're going to have individuals on the ground who, who have access to cell phones, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, that are going to actually be uh, uh, chronicling and identifying things that are happening on the ground in their communities. And as that information trickles up, it's a incomp incumbent upon us and these are uh, the tech companies that are, you know, a part of this process, even though they're not necessarily held to the same standard, to, uh, to be diligent in this process because of what we know now, because of the, the kind of inklings of what could happen and know that anxiety and that kind of idea of, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say fear, but awareness and wanting to be engaged and understanding what's going on um, needs to be monitored and it needs to be kind of regulated and it needs to be done in a, in a kind of uniform order. So we are, we're not actually getting information, finding out something and we're circulating it without it being validated. And then that's kind of how, how things occur and spread, particularly within our community. Because if I get a message from a relative that says X, it's the gospel. I'm not questioning it. And I'm just going to spread it. I'm going to get in a group chat and I'm hitting one button and then I'm going to say, did you hear? And it's, oh, my God. And by the time it, it spreads, it, it becomes a truth, right? Or some their version of their, a very... Uh, a, a, a version of that truth. So we have to kind of be mindful of that. So we, we would encourage the media outlets and the, the platform that we use to kind of take the time to figure out what actually happened and make sure that that information is disseminated in, a, disseminated in an accurate and timely manner. So we can all be informed in, in the best way while we, we hopefully wait for the results of you know the, the, the outcome of the, of the election. Okay, thank you. So now I'd like to uh, move to some questions that our audience has submitted. And I'll just uh, throw the question out. Any of you who want to address it are welcome to do so. Uh, so one question is, what strategies can local groups use to counter or disrupt the spread of disinformation via social media? Any, any of you who would like to address that? Uh, I'll jump in here a little bit. I, I think I'll go back to what I said earlier, just really trusted sources in your circle, in your community. 
Um, if something is coming from an outside source or in ways that it, it, you haven't received that information before, you have to ask yourself again, why is it coming to me? Where is it coming from? And what's the purpose of it? And then what is it saying? Therefore, you can be discerning in that information before you even become a un, un, unknown or unwilling participant in the transition in the transfer of, of inaccurate information. So I think you know we as voters and, and civic-minded individuals should use that as a first step of, of um, engagement prior to to disseminating information. I will add uh, one Go thing. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Middleman. I'll add one thing in addition to kind of piggyback on what Dr. Mahano was saying earlier about how we're, what Howard is doing with freedom schools, right? Reliving the idea that we have a responsibility to take care of our own communities. Uh, and I would suggest and recommend that local civic groups and organizations, neighborhood uh, groups, uh, DC particularly, perhaps east of the river, hold information sessions on misinformation, uh, bring in college students, perhaps from Howard and other places uh, throughout DC to uh, educate the community there about what they may see. I mean, put, you know, I know most students carry around uh, uh, you know, a, a note and a pen, and they have um, um, they have a notebook and a pen. Uh, if they don't have that, they might have a cell phone, and they and they sit down and they can in fact educate people really quickly about something that that uh, for an older generational member perhaps it might be a little bit more challenging to do. So I would encourage local groups to connect with uh, students that are here in DC uh, or and or connect with organizations and centers uh, like we have at Howard. Uh, to actually provide the educational resources in your community so that uh, we don't have to guess whether or not people know what misinformation looks like. You know, we can perhaps set up a tutoring session where we t show, you know, turn on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and show what happens when you, you know, send an, a message that uh, will result in a, a disclaimer appearing and right and have a discussion about that. I encourage us to do, you know, that kind of hands-on applied real work here. And I think that that might actually be effective. And Keisha, for, you wanted to jump in? I did, thank you. Um, and this is this is applicable for, for any organization local here in DC or, or across the nation. But on election night or election day going forward until a decision is made, I really do think these organizations, because they're already credible sources, they're already known to provide information as it relates to ballot access or election um, data, or even just being able to educate people on the electoral process. I think they have to take the initiative and literally tweet out, post on Facebook consistently to drain out any of the misinformation. And using credible sources and literally, I don't wanna use the word tsunami, but tsunami of good, factual, correct information is one way we can counter information immediately for next week versus waiting for disinformation to get rolling and then trying to counter it. That we have to take the initiative to send out factually correct information first and credible sources like local organizations can do that. Uh, we have a question about different groups of people of color. And uh, it seems to be a reference to African-Americans, uh, Latinos, and other ethnic groups. The question is, are there similarities and or differences in how disinformation is being targeted against different groups of people of color? Like, for example, are Latinos subject to disinformation in, in a different manner than African-Americans? No. Yes. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, there was a report out recently about the use of uh, WhatsApp. You know, I'm originally from the Caribbean, and most people who are from uh, places outside of the United States use that free service to communicate with friends and families. Uh, but what's happening now, with uh, particularly with the the, uh, the Republican Party, if I will, uh, they're using WhatsApp to, and uh, providing um, what we what we're talking about now, according to our reports, where they have robocalls and they have average targeted advertising in the language uh, and they're providing information about policies that may affect immigration status and a bunch of litany of things that are on that agenda. And if I'm getting that message in language, meaning in Spanish or whatever, you know, my, my lo local dialect is and it's coming from WhatsApp. So why would I not believe it? 
right? You know, who would take the time to, to put a message in Spanish that tells me what's going on and not check to see that it's credible. So we have been targeted. We've been targeted, as I talked, as I said, in language, in methods and mediums that we use in a way that we communicate that's effective for us and necessarily uh, to, in necessarily doing so with information that may not be 100% accurate. And once we get it from that trusted source, quote, source, quote unquote, we tend to just take it as the gospel and we, we don't question it. And then it helps inform our, our opinions and then ultimately how we behave, how we engage, how we disengage and so forth and so on. So I, I think there are definitely some similarities in the strategies and techniques that are used. And the, the misinformation strategies also differ on who they target. So the, there's these racialized messages going out to black voters that are not going out to Latino voters. So as Dr. Caruso said, the immigration issue goes out to Spanish speaking um, voters. They may or may not be in a mixed documented family, but it's around immigration issues. For the black community, the racial messages and the misinformation is around like, oh, if you have a vote in ballot, your information will use um, to collect your back child support that's in arrears. Or you will, if you've got an old, if you vote by mail, they'll, the government will use that information to get you on an old warrant. And so these really racialized ter um, misinformation is used to target very particular communities. And, and enough of them will be dissuaded and like, well, I better not vote because I don't want the government to know where I live or I don't want my information stolen. Um, and one last point, they're also using robocalls in Michigan and Pennsylvania that are targeting black voters and Latino voters and, and Spanish speaking voters in very different ways, but using this racialized language to instill fear in them so they don't vote. And we know from 2016, you shave off one or 2% in a few communities and that can literally change the outcome of the election. I would, I, oh no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Robbie, or uh, Bahia. Yeah, I was going to add very quickly to that, and then you can go, uh, Dr. Perry. Um, bots, you know, we're, we're talking about robots. You know, these are individuals that, uh, not even individuals, these are programmed um, mechanisms that look at the different information that's tweeted out, the, the language that you use, kind of scouring through your post, and then replicates it. So you're talking about... Uh, non-Pacific uh, Islanders, indigenous communities, black communities, Latinx communities, um, all individuals targeted through the nuances of the information that you actually put out. So definitely begin to learn a little bit more about bots. And you know, when you have a lot of followers, you could go through your list of followers and you will identify you know, at least 20 to 30 bots uh, that are following and are posting things. And so you, you have to think about um, all of this kind of uh, hot information, uh, I call it the McDonald's culture of information that comes out very quickly. It all cannot be consumed. Um, and so just a few things to think about. Go ahead, uh, Ravi. Oh, no, I, I appreciate it. Uh, no, uh, um, and all I wanted to add was that I think that one of the challenges we want to hopefully see uh, post this election is a little bit more attention on intersectionality right, the bifurcation of Black versus Latino versus, you know, the Latino families uh, uh, and, and where uh, they may find themselves fitting at this current time. Um, and I think that what uh, we hopefully can also remember is that ultimately this uh, project is still uh, um, considering blackness as its core variable, but not blackness limited with any, you know, singularity of definition. And so we certainly are inclusive of all uh, kinds of approaches and uh, inputs and outputs of blackness, depending on how people may define themselves. Um, and I think that's important to emphasize. And, and, and it, that is all deliberate in part because remember that of all the groups, while targeting certainly impacts marginalized people in general, um, it was African Americans that were targeted the most. And I do think that's worth noting yet again. Okay. We have a very interesting question here. Uh, someone wants to know whether the speakers can talk about the explicit link between disinformation campaigns 
and the more official efforts at voter suppression. Uh, and this individual wants to know, like, are they linked in some way? Are they separable? Do they serve different purposes? So kind of, you know, the informal disinformation versus the official efforts at voter suppression. Luckily, we are, luckily, unluckily, we're all really well informed, my, my colleagues and I, about voter suppression. So voter suppression are considered in two ways. There's the informal um, by government, but then there's also the formal ways of suppressing the vote by seeing in Texas, there's one place you can drop off your ballot and people are literally having to drive a hundred miles round trip to drop off their ballot. You can also see limitations on the number of polling places that are open for early voting or the restricted numbers of hours or the long lineups in black communities, but short lineups in white communities because they've, the state has decided to invest money in upgrading the equipment in white communities, but leave the older broken down equipment in the black community. So I consider those voter suppression tactics. The informal voter suppression tactics is when the police may park their car outside of a polling place in a black community, but not in a white community. What is that signal sending to voters? And that's the voter suppression aspect. I'm, I'm just giving a few examples and I'll let my colleagues talk about misinformation around that. Any other reactions from our panelists? Yeah, I would only um, add there that I, um, and this is complete conjecture I will throw out there, um, but I think that there is a link in terms of misinformation and disillusionment and that uh, voters uh, who are victims of misinformation, who receive information that they know to be false, but we also know from political scientists and political psychologists that have studied conspiratorial theories and their impact on political participation is that that does in fact uh, discourage people not only from voting, but from participating in the American political process at all. And from, in some cases, even believing in the two party system to the extent that they believe in it ever at all. Uh, and so misinformation is dangerous, not only because of an immediate election, but because it, it really does have the power uh, to discourage people from investing uh, in the political institutions that govern their lives. And if they choose to disinvest from the one most locus of power uh, that uh, as uh, of course late uh, uh, representative John Lewis uh, framed it that way as related to the power of the vote. Um, if we disinvest from that, um, then we are in many ways uh, resigning our own uh, kind of misfortune. And, and so I think the challenge uh, hopefully is that people see the dangers of misinformation, not just as an immediate problem because we have an election in the coming days, but as a real threat to uh, trying to encourage minority people to not believe that the system, while imperfect and certainly has, was not built to include us initially, is yet the same system that we must go to to submit the redress of the wrongs that we petition. And I would just add to that to say that I, I think it's a wonderful question. Thank you so much to the audience participant um, who posed that question as it relates to our particular study, specifically looking at misinformation and voter suppression, we do have ethnographic components tied into the study where we really are uh, getting boots on the ground out and looking to see, you know, in Ward 1 versus Ward 7, are there differences? Uh, do we actually see the uh, police car on the outside of some of these localities? Is the information actually correct that is posted? And so we really plan to explore this a lot deeper. Um, although we have a, a kind of understanding of some of the components that go to play, we really wanna put evidence-based uh, knowledge behind it um, for this particular study. And so specifically the way that we engage students in going out and seeing what these sites are looking like will give us an opportunity to compare across the wards. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question and this is a dynamite uh, question. It's from a high school junior uh, who is watching uh, this uh, webcast. This person wants to know, do you think disinformation 
and misleading voters should be illegal. <laughs> that is a provocative question. It's a great question. It's a great way to end this session. Any thoughts? I was going to pass this on my legal colleagues. <laughs> and I was going to pass to Dr. Carruth, our communication expert. Oh, well, I think I could do both of those. <laughs> we know. <laughs> um, the, you know, there was a there was there was a uh, a debate not too long ago. For example, we're going back, and I'll just use social media as an example. Should bloggers and influencers have to be credentialed, right? Meaning that they have such a high power influence. We go through four years of college, and you get certified to become experts, and we work in in industry and, and, and journalism, and that gives us a certain level of responsibility and accountability. So when you have folks that have the ability to influence masses, should there be a kind of a, a, a process that they go to, to hold them accountable, as you mentioned, uh, should the information they put in the marketplace uh, not be true? And I, and I think there is some legality to it, but then you have to not only uh, take into account the individual, you have to take into account the outlets that are pushing this information out. So where does the liability land and who's responsible for it? Um, right now, within the social media space, people are, are looking at your TikToks, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, and these other places to, to be held accountable because information is consumed so fast and put into the marketplace so fast that there should be some kind of guidelines or regulations in place to fact check, to verify, and it may slow down the, the delivery of this information, but then it may put us in a, in a situation where we <coughs> can then be discerning about the information that we we receive because we know it's been somewhat vetted, right? So to, to answer your question, I hopefully I did, I wouldn't necessarily say people should be arrested or you know, it should be illegal, but there should be some measure of, of accountability. And I go back to the fourth estate because there is a, you know, they say honor amongst thieves, right? We are in a situation where as journalists, we should be able to call our colleagues on either side of the fence, either side of, the media spin, so to speak, and say, hey, um, we have an obligation to be as truthful as possible to the public that, that uh, consumes our information, that rely on us at five o'clock, six o'clock, 11 o'clock, make sure that we're putting information out there because for most folks, this is really their only source of information, mm -hmm. right? You, you think about it, we did a study uh, during the national disaster with, with Noah and elderly folks only got the information from local news. I know we have to wrap up, but um, in, in a nutshell, there should be some form of accountability. Should it be legal? I'm not 100% sure. Illegal. I would only add uh, to this as a part time political theorist that the, you know, what the brilliance I think of the uh, high school students' question is about this idea of should, normative question. Right, you know, uh, given that this is a study on uh, primarily uh, uh, broad definitions of black misinformation here in DC, particularly east of the river, particularly perhaps deep in Ward seven and eight that have been historically disenfranchised, this roughly seven, 800,000 population of mostly black folks for uh, decades and decades by of course, uh, the same federal government and Congress that has disenfranchised black people nationwide for so long. And that one of those, of course, core documents, the 13th Amendment still technically allows uh, uh, physical confinement, right, as uh, related to uh, the so-called commission of a crime. And as we all know, because we've all watched Law and Order, um, that, you know, if we haven't gone to law school ourselves, um, is that, you know, when uh, someone is given the opportunity for clemency and to perhaps go home and, and be home with their families again, they have to answer the question of whether or not they will be a threat to society. Uh, the judge has to right, make that, uh, 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 that declarative judgment. Uh, before that person is so, quote unquote readmitted to society. And by the way, 5 million of those people right now uh, are African Americans who are currently disenfranchised from their right to vote. But uh, to wrap up my point here being that the, sh the should narrative here, I think is what's really interesting. Given that black folks have been historically uh, the ones that have been assumed to have been a threat to society, 
Certainly, if people who are doing misinformation, what we may consider or maybe media wants to consider as maybe more white collar crimes perhaps, we need to, I think, be very honest about the level of danger that misinformation inflicts. And if we can have people going to jail for a lifetime because they stole hedge clippers, I certainly would suggest as a personal uh, uh, suggestion to answer the should question that perhaps some legal penalties um, um, to the extent that this could be proven in court is something that we should consider going forward. Okay, well, thank you very much. This was a terrific conversation. I want to congratulate you on the uh, grant and this uh, project. Very interesting uh, findings, and uh, it'll be interesting to see the uh, future work that you undertake. So I want to thank uh, Keisha, Ravi, uh, Bahia, and uh, Roger uh, for uh, participating in this event. Uh, those of you who would like more information, again, you can check out the Howard University website, digitaldemocracy.howard.edu. Uh, and as they uh, complete their research, they'll be uh, updating that site and providing other information. So uh, thank you to our panelists and thanks to the audience for uh, tuning in. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.